our bill, our bill banning assault weapons is constitutional and it is in force in the state of Illinois right now. That's uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker at the Illinois State Fair reacting to uh, not just Friday's Illinois Supreme Court ruling upholding the state's gun and magazine ban, but uh, he was also talking Our- about uh, uh, the the fact that uh, Tom divorce cases were dismissed in the uh, county court, and we'll uh, obviously connect with uh, Tom DeVore coming up here in just moments, so stay tuned for that with Springfield's Morning News on 92.7 WMAY, Springfield's News and Talk. I'm Greg Bishop, uh, but uh, something else happening yesterday in litigation against Illinois' gun and magazine ban, and that is the case that was brought by the National Shooting Sports Foundation challenging the state's new law that allows for civil liability to uh, ultimately be filed against the gun industry uh, players, uh, those who are either making firearms or selling firearms or advertising firearms. Uh, House Bill 218, it uh, ultimately allows for the attorney general to bring action or for any individual to bring action against those in the firearms industry and uh, charge them for uh, allegedly making the public less safe or charging that they're violating the law by advertising to children with cartoon characters or by advertising for paramilitary or militia activity that the state deems unlawful. So again, that measure was signed on Saturday. And on Monday, you had the National Shooting Sports Foundation file their lawsuit against the states over this particular uh, bill that uh, ultimately passed. Uh, uh, along party lines and the Democratic supermajority uh, getting that through. But on Monday, the National Shooting Sports Foundation sued. And then on Tuesday, you had an initial assignment to uh, Judge uh, Betty and uh, or Judge Beatty. And it, that was randomly assigned on Tuesday. But the latest here is you scroll all the way down into the docket and you can see that uh, the case was reassigned to Judge Stephen McGlynn. So Stephen McGlynn, the judge who uh, said that the state's gun and magazine ban in the Southern District uh, violated the Constitution or was likely to violate the Constitution and issued a preliminary injunction that only lasted six days. Well, Stephen McGlynn is going to be the judge on this case uh, challenging the state's um, uh, law allowing for anyone to sue uh, the, uh, the gun manufacturers or uh, firearms dealers or really anybody in the firearms space. So this is a, a, an interesting turn of events with uh, Stephen McGlynn getting the case now in the Southern District of Illinois. What that means for uh, the future of this particular law, it's a great question. Uh, and I think something that some of you can read into, given the fact that McGlynn is indeed uh, the the judge who said State's gun and magazine ban is likely unconstitutional, so we're going to let a preliminary injunction uh, be put in place. So what we've seen now is uh, several laws that the governor has signed. Uh, you know, they, they deal with all kinds of things, right? A lot of uh, focus has been on the Second Amendment, shall not be infringed. That's obviously a uh, uh, fundamental constitutional right that's being challenged in federal court when it comes to the gun and magazine ban. But First Amendment issues are also very much central uh, to some of the governor's policies, and one of them being the, uh, the, the ability for lawsuits to be filed against the firearms industry for advertising or for whatever, uh, be it, uh, you know, making the public less safe. But the advertising component really does hit on some some First Amendment free speech issues. Others are arguing that it also uh, likely could bump into uh, free assembly issues when you talk about, you know, paramilitary or, or militia activity. Uh, so interesting to, to hear some of that uh, in, in the conversation about this. But other free speech issues that uh, the governor's policies have, uh, have, have been challenged on include that measure that was blocked recently by a federal judge uh, to allow the state to go after crisis pregnancy pregnancy centers for, quote, deceptive practices if those crisis pregnancy centers do not have uh, abortion as a, an option. If they steer people away from an abortion, uh, then then the law 
before it was blocked with a preliminary injunction by a federal judge, uh, it would have allowed for for that to uh, to take place. So uh, obviously, you've got uh, a lot of movement in uh, the federal courts challenging Pritzker's policies, and uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, measure dealing with uh, the the gun and magazine ban and how it's still pending in the federal uh, appeals courts. When they're going to release that opinion, who knows? Uh, but we did talk about how uh, you've got the uh, the plaintiffs in that case uh, pointing to the recent ruling from a federal judge out of Hawaii that said that the butterfly knife ban was unconstitutional. Uh, so the plaintiffs in the Seventh Circuit challenging Illinois' gun and magazine ban are asking the judges in that appeals panel to review that before they decide. Uh, so that's the latest in the Seventh Circuit. Uh, but again, in the Southern District, totally separate case about the gun uh, industry liability law. Judge Stephen McGlynn has been issued to that. He's been the judge that's uh, assigned to that after uh, a random selection uh, went to uh, Judge Beatty. So uh, Stephen McGlynn taking over that case. So those are some of the cases dealing with, uh, uh, you know, the the the, the federal courts, uh, but we've also got the the state courts, and we saw, of course, on Friday, the state supreme courts uphold the state's gun and magazine ban, uh, and that was from State Representative Dan Calkins. Uh, he brought that case uh, after Attorney Thomas DeVore uh, advanced his cases representing thousands of individuals and gun stores, uh, getting temporary restraining orders in place. Uh, so it was a little unclear as to exactly how divorce cases would proceed if they would proceed and we got some indication this week as to how that would happen and uh, joining us right now is tom devore greatly appreciate you taking the time this morning tom uh but let's get into it uh, what's the latest with your case and uh what's going to happen with with your plaintiffs moving forward you've got thousands of plaintiffs uh on this case and uh looking forward to seeing what uh, what happens next yeah, good morning, Greg. The uh, We got the docket entry from the judge in the Effingham County Court. Uh, it was a little surprising given that after the Supreme Court ruled that there wasn't a hearing set, but so be it. It happens in court all the time. It just usually doesn't happen uh, when people hear about it because it impacts, you know, at least 7,000 people in this case, but millions of people across the state. So the, uh, you know, Judge Jarman dismissed our client's case taking the position that the Calkins ruling was precedential and finding that, you know, I guess he was finding that under no set of facts could any citizen of this state proceed successfully <clears throat> on an equal protection claim, which is not remotely what the Illinois Supreme Court said. The Illinois Supreme Court ruling was clear, and it was clear based upon the concerns that you know I raised months ago when Dan Calkins filed this case, is that they had no record and no way to prove that they were, in fact, similarly situated to the exempt classes in the statute. So, you know, that was a threshold issue that the Illinois Supreme Court said Dan couldn't satisfy because he didn't do any discovery, no record. But but certainly, and again, I don't necessarily disagree with that particular, you know, argument that the Supreme Court uh, made. It doesn't say that equal protection doesn't lie as a violation, just says you didn't prove it. And so that's why our case was different, and we were proceeding with discovery, et cetera. And we do, in fact, already have evidence that shows that uh, we can prove it. But, you know, Judge Jarman, for whatever reason, didn't make that analysis. So we're going to file a motion to reconsider before we decide, you know, or before, we're not going to decide. We will appeal to the Fifth Appellate District, absolutely. Uh, but before we appeal, we're going to at least put it back in front of Judge Jarman and say, you need to take a look at this. It's not what the Supreme Court said. So yesterday, the governor was uh, asked about the status of his gun and magazine ban, and uh, this is uh, some of what he had to say. Uh, just uh, uh, paraphrasing before we hear the bite, he talked about uh, you know this uh, grifters out there trying to you know uh, be able to pounce on the the the, the questions of constitutionality, and uh, he ultimately proclaims that uh, he believes his uh, his law is constitutional. Our bill. Our bill banning assault weapons is constitutional and it is in force in the state of Illinois right now. So, Tom, uh, obviously, you know, the governor uh, standing by saying that uh, he believes it's constitutional. Uh, where is he wrong on this? Where he's wrong is that there's never been a ruling by any court yet that says that this law is, in fact, constitutional. You know, Governor Pritzker, with all due respect, is more of a politician than he is a lawyer. 
And, and if you even, you know, I don't agree with much of what Mr. Calkins lawyer has ever done on any of Dan's case. But one of the things that Jerry and I do agree on, is the Supreme Court ruling didn't say that this law is absolutely under any set of facts un- or constitutional. It said that Dan failed to meet the burden. So the governor's wrong. He believes it's constitutional, and I'm not going to disrespect him for that. But no court, federal or state, has said with unequivocal conclusion this law is constitutional. And the judge or the governor, you know, being a, lo- a lawyer by license only, uh, has no idea what he's talking about. Well, and uh, one thing that was clear just in the first few paragraphs of the Illinois Supreme Court's ruling was they didn't consider the Second Amendment arguments in this at all. Mm-hmm. Nor did they consider the three readings rule, which, you know, I've been after hot and heavy. They said that actually Dan Calkins waived that argument, which is something that I was adamant that they should have never waived. And you had two justices on the Supreme Court that made it clear. I thought Justice Overstreet and Justice White, that that should have been the issue to carry the day, because, it, again, it's not even an argument they violated three readings. You know that and I know that. I think the state knows that. But whether or not the Supreme Court's going to wade into that or not. I know two of them do. And the opinion in, you know, Justice O'Brien's dissent probably was the most important writing in that whole opinion. We're talking with Thomas DeVore, of course, the attorney who uh, secured thousands of temporary restraining orders against Illinois' gun and magazine ban, but those have been uh, dissolved. And uh, he's going to be, of course, uh, looking to have a uh, a motion filed to reconsider. And then uh, ultimately, uh, I imagine you're going to appeal to the appeals court in state court. Uh, Tom, even if you get up to the Supreme Court, with this case, with the evidence that you've got backed up and whatnot, uh, what do you do about the questions of conflict of interests? We've seen how two of the Supreme Court justices that when they were candidates received a million dollars each from Governor J.B. Pritzker and six figures from uh, House Speaker Emanuel Chris Welch, who both are lead defendants in the case uh, that at least Calkins brought. But what would you do with that question of conflict of interest? Uh, would you would you pursue a recusal? motion? Would you take it to the U.S. Supreme Courts to to challenge it on a, a Caperton challenge? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm not going to do either because, you know, I understand the argument being made there, Greg, but but the people of this state and this nation need to understand something. And I'm glad, I hope they're starting to see it. The judiciary is a political beast, just like the rest of the branches of government, because it has human beings in it. And the justices that receive those donations They have political beliefs just like you and I, and they probably have political beliefs that align with the governors. That's no different than the justices of the Supreme Court appointed by President Trump or President Obama. They lean a certain way in their beliefs. What that means from a lawyer's perspective, this is very important because this is where Jerry uh, Stocks and his team and Dan failed. What that means, Greg, is that when you go in front of those justices with a legal matter that you know in their core where they probably stand on it, you got to make such a compelling case that they'll change their mind. It happened with Justice O'Brien. Changed their mind for good legal reason, and that would have been the case, in my legal opinion, if the job would have been done to show that they're not, these exempt classes, many of them are not similarly situated or or are similarly situated to the citizens. This training argument that they've made appeared for the first time, Greg, in a courtroom argued by a lawyer. It's nowhere in the record of the legislature. It's nowhere in an affidavit signed by anybody in the legislative branch of government. It was an argument made. And Justice O'Brien was right. What uh, if the purpose of this law is to bring these weapons down in numbers off the streets? Now, that's a tall proposition, whether this law would ever do it or not. Let's set that aside and assume that that is the legislative purpose. Get the guns off the streets. Then why do people that are trained get to continue to buy all they want? What does training have to do with reducing the numbers? Absolutely nothing. It's irrational. I know why it's irrational, but I'm not going to throw my fellow lawyers under the bus. But those arguments could have been made and laid bare in front of the Supreme Court with facts. And that's how you win this case at the Illinois Supreme Court, potentially. And that's why Calkins lost, because he didn't take any of those facts. And lawyers like me and good lawyers know that 
a court will do what they can to leave that law in place unless they have enough facts to make it go away and to say it's unconstitutional. That's why they lost, and that's what I would do differently, and I wouldn't even try to recuse those justices. I'm going to argue to them why they should think differently. Attorney Thomas DeVore with us. Uh, We've got just a few more minutes here, uh, but kind of, I guess, some of the logistics of uh, your clients. Uh, They, of course, 7,000 plus across uh, several counties and several cases consolidated in Effingham County. Those TROs Mm -hmm. being dissolved this week as the case was dismissed. You plan on uh, having a reconsideration motion and then ultimately appealing. Uh, So we'll see what happens there. But your clients, I mean, they had that TRO in place and they went out and purchased firearms. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen to those firearms and those individuals? Uh, the state Nothing. police, at least, well, at least during the uh, uh, the injunction that was issued from the Southern District Federal Court, state police say any firearms purchased during the six days are not in compliance with the state law uh, because they weren't possessed before January 10th. What happens with your TRO clients? Well, wait, let, let me say this with all due respect to the Illinois State Police and to Brandon Kelly and the Attorney General and the governors is. It's political propaganda, and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And let me tell you why, Greg, because you're probably the only one that would ever write about this. The proposition stands that as of January 10th, these weapons weren't possessed by these individuals. And due to a court order, which means the law, they were able to acquire them subsequent to January 10th, but then they lost that exempt status under the temporary restraining order, correct? Take somebody that's exempt under the statute, let's say a somebody in the military, and they buy one after January 10th under the statute, not under the court order, and then they retire from the military. They're no longer exempt under the statute. Are they also breaking the law? Because the registry requirement that the Illinois State Police and the AG, and they're all trying to talk about that you can't complete that affidavit because you didn't own it before the 10th, not only does it apply to my clients, it applies to every exempt, statutorily exempt person who becomes non-exempt after January 10th. This law doesn't deal with them either. So the fact of the matter is, whether you're exempt under the statute or whether you were for some amount of time exempt under the law, which is a court order and they're co-equal branches of government, that TRO was just as in force and effect as the exemptions in the statute. All of those people are in the same boat because they cram this law through at the, in the middle of the night And the registry doesn't deal with people who lawfully bought after the 10th, but then became non-exempt by some other operation. It doesn't deal with any of them. So I'm not I'm not even worried about that. And and that would be also for those during that six day window from the Southern District injunction. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. A court order, a, a restraining order or the orders entered by these courts have the same legal authority as the exemptions in the statute. And so. The statute doesn't deal with those folks, and I gave you an example, doesn't deal with my clients or the people under the federal registry. That's not going anywhere. That's just political fodder thrown around by people that are trying to scare individuals that don't even think it through with any level of analysis. And I challenge you to ask that question about someone exempt under the statute, and then they become non-exempt. Are they also breaking the law? See, watch them mumble over their words, Greg, when you ask that question. Attorney Tom DeVore, uh, finally here. Of course, we've got the political days that have been going on at the state fair. You ran for attorney general in the last cycle. What is your political future? I'm not running for office again in my right now as I sit here. I don't have any desire. You know, I'm equally, uh, you know, critical of Republicans as I am Democrats. But I am working on some things, and there are things that are focused on one goal, and that's how Republicans can win elections in the state of Illinois. It's not an easy conversation because you've got a big, you know, bright line between the grassroots, which is where I'm from, and the establishment, which I get along with fine, even though we disagree. And I'm working on some things, and you'll hear about it here coming up, is how do we win elections? And if I can help bring people to the table to where we can win elections and get rid of the likes of a J.B. Pritzker, Uh, I'm all for those conversations, and that's what I'm working on. Attorney Thomas DeVore, greatly appreciate you taking the time with us this morning. We'll definitely be talking again soon. Have a good day, Greg. It is Springfield's Morning News on 92.7 WMAY, Springfield's News and Talk, and uh, much more coming up. Stay tuned. Follow me anywhere, Bishop on Air, at gmail.com, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Just search Bishop on Air.